What's up guys, it's MTG Mad for you, back with another video on Innistrad Midnight Hunt actually, because I just finished watching the review stream for Innistrad Midnight Hunt, and I just want to take the chance and go through these cards here real quick, like the first preview cards we got today are September 2nd, please keep in mind that I'm doing this video right after the review stream, so I might miss some more preview cards that come out today on September 2nd, but this is not really a card review, it's just more of a first impression video. And I'm gonna go through the first new Innistrad cards uh, from common rarity up to mythic rarity. And let's just see what this um, set is going to offer, what's the first impression here. So we'll get started here and let me actually just zoom in, this seems better. Okay, so we start with Unruly Mob, 2 mana, 1 more human in white. Whenever another creature you control dies, put a 1-1 counter on Unruly Mob. Uh, I gotta say, I think it's kind of an interesting effect in white. Usually you would probably just um, suspect this kind of effect in, you know, on black humans. But this is a white one. And, I mean, we haven't seen the whole set yet. I would guess this won't see any play. But it is, is a human and it gives you uh, payoffs for sacrificing creatures. But then again, it's just a 2 mana 1-1, one, one. so it probably won't see play. But um, I think, yeah, it's got an uh, important tribe, right, in human. It's a 2 mana 1-1 one, one, and it can give you some payoff for sacrificing creatures. So, I don't know, maybe is some aristocrat style deck. Uh, comes around. Maybe this is some kind of payout, but I highly doubt it. So for now I would say this probably won't see a big play in standard, in competitive standard. Let's go at Festival Crasher, a 2 mana 1 free devil in red. Whenever you cast it into a sorcery spell, Festival Crasher gets plus 2, plus 0 until end of turn. So a very, um, how would you say, a very usual effect. You've seen stuff like this a lot already in Magic. And it can occasionally be really good as a payoff card. If you can change some spells, this can become really big. But it's just until end of turn. And right now, I don't see um, an Izzet spell slinging deck be a thing. Um, even though we're gonna get a lot of additions. Like right now, Izzet is mainly, in standard 2022, Izzet is mainly about dragons, right? Or. Uh, about the mill deck where you copy your mill spells. So there isn't really a deck right now that could use this festival crasher. So I would um, probably assume this won't see play, but we do get flashbacks. So we're gonna have instant sorceries we can play once from our hand and then once from the graveyard, which makes it easier triggering this guy. So I don't think it's gonna be a great card, but it's. Uh, you know, it's that kind of effect that can sometimes fit really well into an aggressive deck if you have enough instant sorceries. Let's go with Pestilent Wolf. 2 mana, 2, 2. Wolf in green. Pay 3 mana against Death Tower and Death Turn. Well, this is just for draft, and even draft is probably not that great. Unless you have some kind of uh, werewolf or wolf tribe synergies. Next, I've got another wolf, Snarling Wolf. 1 mana, 1, 1 green. Pay 2 mana, it gets plus 2 plus 2 on the left turn, activate on once each turn. Again, this is only for draft, and even draft, unless you have a wolf tribe, probably not that interesting. Next, we've got Howl of the Hunt, 3 mana enchantment aura in green with flash. Enchant creature. When Howl of the Hunt enters the battle, if enchanted creature is a wolf or werewolf, untap the creature, and then enchanted creature gets plus 2 plus 2 and has vigilance. This is a neat a little combat trick in uh, draft. For constructed, this won't see any play, obviously. By the way, I I told I really love the art of the set and the flavor and everything. Uh, just looks really great. Okay, next up we. Wait, what? Read the web fiction to find out more. Okay, I think this is actually not on the card. It's just uh, basically copied out from the website where this card was revealed. So, secrets of the key. Uh, before we read this card, actually in the real stream they talked a bit about the lore of the set and everything and Teferi and I think her name is Erin, they try to find some solution for solving or like restoring the day-night cycle. So 
We already know about the Aaron Planeswalker. I'm very curious to see what they have in store as the Fairy Planeswalker. Because in recent history, the Fairy Planeswalkers have rather been broken a lot of times. So I'm curious to find out what's gonna be this time. So Secrets of the Key, one mana instant in blue, Investigate. So Investigate is back, right? Investigate creates an artifact token. Uh, which you can pay two mana for to sacrifice and to just draw a card. So it's just some nice card advantage. So two mana instant investigate. If the spell was cast from a graveyard, investigate twice instead. And you can cast it from graveyard with flashback for four mana. Now this card... Um, I think this card is very hard to evaluate. So I think if you have a deck where you want to chain little spells to have to have effects triggered uh, that are triggered by casting instant or sorcery spells. Um, Secrets of the Key might be really good because it's kind of like a cantrip, right? You have to pay bl one blue mana, then you get your triggers from your stuff, and then you have to pay an additional two mana to draw again, and then later you can pay four mana to get two token, two clue tokens, and then you pay a total of 4 mana for 2 more cards. So, all in all, if you cast Secrets of the Key twice and pay for all the clue tomes, you pay a total of 11 mana for 3 cards, which is obviously bad, but you're paying in installments, right? Which is the reason this might be okay. Um, there also might be some synergies with clues we don't know about yet. Um, like my, my initial impression tells me that I want to like this card because um, it in, in one single card it represents a lot of uh, card advantage that which you can pay for over periods of time. And since it's an instant, uh, the, while the flashback is quite expensive at four mana, uh, if you're like a control deck and hold on your mana. You can occasionally just fit in the four mana and just, you know, pay, play this and get two more clue tokens. And this way, just make sure that you have always have enough cards in your hand and keep building your card advantage if you play against another control deck or non-control deck, right? So, Secrets of the Key, I think there might be something here, right? You probably want to have more synergies than... Like, you probably want to have some synergies with this card, I guess. So you want to um, benefit from triggering stuff with casting this instant. But if you do, I mean, maybe like, just like a two-off in a control deck, even without any synergies, might even be fine. Maybe. I mean, if you're playing like Demir control deck instead of 2022, those tend to run Liliana, right? And Liliana has a Magecraft. So Secrets of the Key can give you some little synergy there. So... This is a card I'm really not sure about whether it's going to see play, but the fact that it's initially just costing one mana, it's an instant, has flashback and so forth, I think there is something here. Okay, I actually want to keep this uh, short. Next up, we got our first rare. Wait, actually... I think I messed up the order, that's fine. First rare is Zareth, the Viper Fang, 4 mana, 3, 4 in green. Uh, human Warlock, it's a legendary creature. Other tap creatures you control have death touch, other untapped creatures you control have hexproof. And you can one pay one tap Zarif to untap another target creature or land you control. I think this is a very powerful 4 drop in green. First off, give all your attacking creatures death touch is really, really nice. And so it's uh it has an immediate impact on the board offensively, but also defensively. If you leave your creatures untapped, or even if your creatures have Vigilance, they all have Hexproof, which is very, very powerful. And then this activatability is like a goodie on top, which you might occasionally use, but but I think that won't be really relevant. So, I think this is a really nice card for green. And I gotta say, if you've been playing some standard 2022, uh, Mono Green is a thing, and Mono Green has access to a lot of very great, efficient cards. It's a... Very aggro heavy, very pressure heavy deck. And with this card added, and we haven't even, re haven't even seen the rest of set yet, 
Green gets has so many efficient creatures after rotation. Like especially the four drop slot, Green has can choose between Zarif. It can uh, choose between Toski and it can choose between Essigas Chariot. So this is just more good stuff for green and I think this can just fit into the mono green aggro that we have right now in standard 22. So very solid card right here. That's how we got Gilvanic Iteration. A blue and a red instant. Whenever you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may, cho may choose new target for a copy. I can flashback it for a total of three mana. So very efficient car right here. It's a strictly better teach by example, which we already have in standard from Strixhaven. So if there was any deck that would run teach by example, they would just run Galvanic Iteration. And this might see some play in the already existing, is it mill deck that's running around in standard 2022. Apart from that, I'm not sure that it's going to see any play. Because there aren't really any other decks right now that want to copy spells. But if they do, this is obviously a great option because you get two cards in one and the flashback cost is still reasonable. Uh, obviously it's one mana more, but you're just paying one mana more to have two copies of the same card for the cost of one deck slot, which is why flashback is so good. So I don't expect Galvanic Iteration to be a thing outside of uh, this mill deck that we already have. There isn't mill deck, but apart from next, just a solid card. Oh, next up, th this one I'm so excited about. We have a new dual land cycle, and I'm just showing you one of these uh, dual lands right here. It's Rockfall Veil. Vale. They all work the same way, which is when this land enters the battlefield tap, this land enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands. It's just lands. It's not basic lands, non-basic lands, or whatever. It's just as long as you control two lands, you have a dual land that comes into play untapped. Uh, the land itself don't have any land types. So Rockfell Vale is not a mountain and a forest also. But I'm just so happy that they're going to introduce this to Standard because uh, Standard 2022 has shown that we really need better dual lands, better dual lands. The only good dual lands we have right now are Pathways. And then there are, there are the Snarls, which are okay if you're just playing two colors, but um, as soon as you play a three color deck, I feel like the Snarls just don't work anymore. And also, in standard 2022, snow is a big thing, right? If you like, if you play two colors, you almost always automatically want to play snow so you can put phases saves into your deck. And the snarls don't help you with snow mana, right? So um, I'm really happy. So what this means for standard 2022 is that basically, if you're playing a two color deck, you want to play snow unless you have a good reason not to. And if you play a free color deck, um, like playing snow becomes really hard because then you have these snow, a lot of these like snow tap dual lands, which are really inefficient. But then if you want to play free color decks, um, without snow, we don't have good dual lands to support that. So standard 22 has this problem of you can play monocolored, you can play real well dual colored decks, but then that's basically it. it um, if you're going into free color decks, you're running into problems, which is why I'm super happy that they introduced this dual land cycle. This is going to be a must for free color decks for sure, maybe even for two color decks, because they're just more or less unconditional dual lands that come into play untapped. Love this, love this, love this. These are just going to eat your rare wild cards for sure. Uh, very great addition to standard. Next up, we got a card which I think is really, really cool. So it's Jidar Ghoul Card of Nefalia. Two mana, one, one human wizard. It's a legendary creature. And at the beginning of your end step, if you control no creatures with Decayed, create a 2 2 black zombie creature tone with Decayed. So Decayed is a new mechanic from Innistrad, which is. Uh, a creature that is decayed can't block, and when it attacks, sacrifice it at end of combat. So, this guy gives you zombies at the beginning of your end step, and this zombie can block, and then on your next turn, when you can attack, 
with the zombie or zombie attacks and after the after combat uh this zombie just gets sacrificed and um like decay is just a very flavorful mechanic obviously so i already like it because of that but the, this gives the designers basically um a way to create tokens to give more cards an easy way to create tokens without making it overpowered because those uh, tokens sacrifice themselves after combat. An interesting thing to note is that they only get sacrificed after they attack, right? So if you don't attack, they stay on the board, although they can block. And I really love this card because think about it, this is just a two mana card that gives you a two to every turn if you can use the two to, like if you can attack or sacrifice it, right? And um, like very efficient two drops that are, do a lot of for you are always something you should look out for in your sets because the two drop slot is where like control decks tend to, you know, put cards where they can control the game or put some win conditions in there, right? So uh, I could either imagine this card in like a mono black aggro deck. We already have Lolf, which is amazing with this, with this because this just means more tongues that get uh, sacrificed or die. So the Lolf gets even more counters. And it's just a two drop. I mean, I couldn't even imagine it's in like a control deck also with Lolf. Just put this down on turn two. And you know, you just get in there. Every turn you attack or you just hold your uh, black zombie. You use it to sacrifice it to your deadly dispute or village rise. And this guy can just give you a lot of value over the course of the game. And really love this card. I think this card has a lot of potential. So look out for this one. Next up, we got another very powerful card here in Tovalar Dire Overlord. So it's a free mana 3-3 free free in Gruul Colors. It's a human werewolf, legendary creature. So free mana 3-3. Free free. Pretty good stat line. And whenever a wolf or werewolf you control this combat out your player draw a card. Very good. I hear wolf tribal. I mean if wolf tribal becomes a thing, this this card right here is gonna be a carry because at free mana it just gives an aggressive deck the ability to draw cards every time your creatures deal combat damage. So very, very good. Or like every time your wolves or werewolves deal combat damage. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more wolves and a werewolf, it becomes knight. So this refers to the new mechanic of Daybound Nightbound, which I'm gonna explain at the end of this video for those of you guys who haven't heard about it yet. So it becomes knight and then transform any number of human werewolves you control. And this guy is Daybound, Nightbound. I'm gonna explain this later. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you have three or more wolves and werewolves. This includes himself, so you basically just need three creatures on the board. And if you think about it, if you play a wolf on turn one, a wolf on turn two, which by the way, Rangers class, which is played in green decks in standard 2022, gives you a wolf. So there you already have your two drop. Uh, so if you play this on turn three, you might already have three wolves. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, you can transform this guy and become becomes knight. And then when this guy transforms, you get, uh, get Tovalar, the Midnight Scourge. Now he's a werewolf. Uh, still has the same passive or like static effect with drawing card. But he also has the activated ability of X, pay X, red, green. Target wolf or werewolf you control gets plus X plus O against Tramble on the end of turn. Great activated ability for an aggressive deck. Even if you just pay two mana to give, give, uh, to give another creature Trample. Or you can give Trample himself. Very, very nice. And also, if he transforms, he becomes a 4-4. Four, four. So there's even some kind of, you know, stat boost you get there. And I'm very, I'm very certain that this, uh, if there's like a good wolf tribal aggressive deck, probably in rule colors, this guy is going to be a 4 of it. That's going to carry the deck, right? Gives you card draw. Um, it gives you another way of transforming into knight, which is probably very relevant. And then during knight, he has this great activated ability to give other uh, wolves or himself trample and even boost their attack. So very, very solid card right here. And we've got 
uh, a mythic, our first mythic here, Cigar the Champion of Light in Selesnya colors. 4 mana 4-4, four, four, uh, quite a restrictive mana casting cost, you need 2 white, a green and 1 generic. Legendary creature Angel. It's a 4-4 four, four with Flying and Tremble, and humans in control get plus 1 plus 1, so you get an Anthem effect for human tribal. And it's got a new mechanic called Coven. And Coven, like the requirement for Coven is that you have three, creature, three creatures of different powers, um, which then fulfills the requirement for Coven, and then you get a certain effect. And in the case of Zygarda, it's whenever Zygarda attacks, if you control three or more creatures of different powers, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a human creature card from among them and put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. So, if you fulfill the Coven requirement, which is probably not too difficult or not difficult at all in the right deck, and Zygarda attacks, you basically get to draw a card from top five decks. So very nice, and this obviously is for a human tribal deck, right? And if a human tribal deck becomes a thing, this is probably just a four of, right? Um, it gives you an anthem effect, it gives you a nice flyer, four mana four for flying tribal is pretty good, and it gives a card draw. It's a very simple, very straightforward card. It's legendary, so you can't have more than one on the battlefield. But, um, yeah, if human tribal is a thing, this is gonna be a four of, I think. And we've already seen, like, this card, Join the Dance, which gives you two human tokens, two one ones for two mana, and it's got flashback, and it's also in Celestia colors. So there's already some support right there. So this is just a solid card uh, you want to have in a human tribal deck. I'm thinking right now if there would be... Like with the cards we have right now in standard 2022, if um, you would want to put this card in one of those decks, like would you want to go Selesnya? Like would you want to transform Mono White in Selesnya just for this card? Probably not, although Mono White has a lot of humans, but yeah, um, I mean we're gonna see more of the set and there's gonna be more uh, support for the humans, I'm sure. And for that, it's just a really solid card. Also, it's noteworthy, I just uh, realized that, like, remembered that from Kaldheim, there's this 3-mana Angel, Resplendent Angel, that also has tribal support, right? Because you can enter the battlefield, and then you exile a creature card from your graveyard, and you give all your creatures that share a creature type with that creature card you exiled a 1-1 counter, and you get the same effect again when Resplendent Angel dies. So... There are also already some other cards from past sets that you know you could use in that. So there's that. And uh, na last card here is Arlen Pax Hope. Man, this already, video is already going on a long while. So let's wrap this up. Uh, so Arlen Pax Hope, uh, first Planeswalker reveal from the set. It's got Daybound and Nightbound. The way Daybound and Nightbound works is as long as a player has cast a card in a game with Daybound or Nightbound, from that point forward for the rest of the game, it's either night or day, right? This becomes, in the game you're playing, for the moment, this becomes like a permanent mechanic. It's probably depicted as an emblem in Arena. I'm pretty sure about that. And the way night, Daybound and Nightbound works is that um, if it's day, it has the requirement that if a player casts no spells during their own turn, it becomes night next turn. Alright? So let's say it's day, it's my turn, I cast no spells, then the next turn it's night. And nightbound, like the, the uh, requirement for nightbound is if a player casts at least two spells during their own turn, it becomes day next turn. So if it's night and it's my turn, I can play, uh, cast two spells and then it becomes day again. And the reason why this is relevant is because cards that refer to this daybound nightbound mechanic, they either transform depending on uh, whether it is day or night right now. So if we have Arlen Pack Soap on the board and she's on the board as board as daybound and becomes night, she transforms into the nightbound version. But then if it becomes day again, she transforms again into the daybound version. And also what's interesting is, let's take Arling as an example. If you have it in if you have her in your hand 
and it's knight right now, and you play her, she already comes into play as her knight version. Alright, so that's pretty important. And before we read in this plan, so I really like this mechanic, because first of all, it's very flavorful. But what's also nice about this mechanic is that imagine you're playing a deck that's built around Daybound Nightbound, and your opponent is playing a deck that has zero interaction with Daybound Nightbound. Your opponent still gets to interact with it because the requirements always refer to the player whose turn it is. Which means, um, if you let's say you're playing a daybound nightbound deck and your opponent thinks that I don't want to deal with the nightbound side of Arlen next turn, so I'm gonna cast two spells so it becomes day next turn. So your opponent has a way to interact with this mechanic, which I think is really really great. You know you. It just gives this game another an added level or like added layer of complexity. So it's pretty pretty cool. And let's go through this plan story real quick because before I wrap this up. So Arlen Pack Soap is four mana for all the plan story in cool colors. She's daybound. She has a plus one until the next turn you may cast creature spells as though they had flash. And each creature you control ends the battlefield with additional one one counter on it. And minus three is create two 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 green wolf creature tokens. So Obviously, her plus one synergizes with Daybound because, um, like, you can plus one her, like, not the turn you play her, but uh, in a turn you haven't played any spells yet and she's on the board, you can plus one her, not play anything, and then on your opponent's turn you can cast spells, and this way make sure that it's still day if it's relevant to you that you want it to stay day, right? And apart from that, her plus one is actually really cool. Giving all the flash and making her stronger is, you know, just really nice. And it gives you some interaction in your um, in your aggressive deck. And this would already fit uh, real nice into a werewolf or wolf tribal deck. And her minus three is just good stuff, right? I mean, at four mana, she competes with Essica's Chariot to create two 2-2 two, two tokens, which is what Essigas Chariot does. Um, but I could imagine, I could now imagine a Junt deck with her and Lolf, because now we got Battle Duel Land, so you could actually play that. And then you got on four on four mana, you play Arlen, make two tokens, on five mana, you play Lolf, play two tokens, you have a big, really nice board. Seems good. And then on the back side, or like on the night side, we got Arlen Immune Fury. Plus two add red and green, so it's like a it's just a ramp ability, which is pretty interesting actually. And it also gives her ability to replenish her loyalty because I assume that if she flips, she keeps her loyalty that she had. Like if she flips, she's not going back to full loyalty always. So if you minus three her, and then she turns to knight. Um, all in like the the knight side gives you a nice option to replenish those loyalty counters. So plus two, add red and green, just some ramp, and then zero. Until end of turn, all in the immune three becomes a five-five werewolf creature with trample, indestructible, and haste. Very nice. Um, especially nice because if it's already knight and she's in your hand, you can just play her on the knight side, activate your zero ability, and you have a five-five trample, indestructible, haster, which is very powerful, which is really nice. All right. So what do I think about this card? I think it's just a very decent planeswalker. It's gonna go into Werewolf Tribal. As I said, I could imagine jump with this because she makes tokens, and then she can ramp you if that's relevant. Uh, or, you know, after you minus three turns, she can just become a big beater herself. So just a cool planeswalker. I like her. You know, not over the top or anything, but she fits nice into some existing strategies with like, you know, Lolf is some. Um, some cool application. So I really like Arlen right here, and that wraps it up for me. This is gonna be my first impressions. I'm really looking forward to the set. Uh, I think it's looking very promising. I love the flavor. I love the um, what was I saying? I love the mechanics. And actually, let's actually refresh right here before we go back. Um, I'm pretty sure more cards got added. Oh yeah, a bunch more actually. Hell yeah. Um, but I actually wanted to showcase another card which... Oh yeah, right here. I forgot this card. Which showcases another... Um, another mechanic. 
which is this turb, which I also like. This guy has, is called Beloved Beggar, 2 mana 0, 4. And it's got this turb. You may cast this card from your grave or transform for this turb cost. Alright, so it's like another flashback kind of card, right? This guy is just two, a 2 mana 0, 4, but then on the back side, it's a Flying Vigilant Spirit. And if Jaren's Soul would be put into Graveyard from Animal Exile instead. Interestingly, this has also the Daybound Nightbound symbol, which means this should also transform if it's night, I think. I think, right? Yeah, it's the same symbol, so this should work. So, I mean, a draft is probably gonna be real good if you have a way to easily switch to night. You get a 2 mana 4 4. You get a 2 mana Thera Angel, basically. So that's a cool mechanic, and I'm not gonna go through the rest of the cards right now because this video is already very long. But hope you guys enjoyed the video, this has been my first impression. Really looking forward to the set, I think it's gonna be great, just from the first impression. And hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys soon. Hey there, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this kind of content and want to see more fresh decks and standard meta decks, please consider subscribing, I would really appreciate it, and i see you guys soon.